uh, reference about me, just so that you can uh, uh, plug into where my experience is coming from with my kids. Uh, I have been teaching for 13 years, and uh, my background in school was in music. I studied opera performance and um, foreign languages, but then later, after I had my oldest son, decided to go back to get my teaching certification. And uh, I became a teacher well before I knew I had any children with any disabilities. So I applied for this teaching certification thinking I was going to teach English. And they said, by the way, you have some qualities that might make you a good special education teacher. Would you consider that? They had a shortage of special education teachers. So I said, sure. And I began teaching special education in Texas. Uh, and then seven years into teaching, uh, my second child was born and started showing symptoms of autism, also developed epilepsy, and I no longer had just this role of being a teacher, I was also the parent of a special needs child. And then uh, a few years after that came the diagnosis of my son Jordan, and he is the one that has complete agenesis, and we found out when he was 12 years old. So um, a lot of the things that I'll talk about will have these stories of my kids kind of embedded in there, as well as my students um, that I've taught over the years. But I, I wear the hat of a mother of two boys with special needs, and also as an educator with uh, special education teaching. Primarily um, 11 years of special education teaching, but right now I'm focusing on English. I kind of come back around to teaching English. Um, I work with students who are um, meeting inclusion support all the way up to uh, sorry, uh, pre AP. And I also um, work with students who are second language learners. So um, that's a little bit about my background with my uh, profession as well as my kids. Um, so I want to start with a short little video that I made. I made this, and I showed this if you have attended my session um, two years ago. I showed this. this is same video, I have made more of them, so this is an older one. But I make this for my son's teachers, he's now in high school, and I, I do this because I realize as teachers we get overloaded with paperwork, so I, I experimented with making a video so that the, um, the teachers can get a quick glance at my child and get to know his needs, because I can tell you that t although teachers have great intentions, we're swarmed with paperwork. And we might have 12 kids with uh, IEPs, and it gets a little difficult to differentiate between them when you have so much paper. So I wanted mine to stand out. Um, so I made this video for my son's teachers when he was in eighth grade, and I played around with it. They, they liked it, so I made it again when he went into ninth grade, and I, I need to make another one this summer. He's going in as a sophomore, and so it, we've got some changes that I need to update. So um, I'll let you get a, a little sense of this video. And I'll lead into our discussion. Hi, I hope you don't mind me introducing myself in video format. My name is Kim Orange, and this is our family. And you have been chosen to have my son, Jordan Glenn, in your class this school year. Uh, I'd like to take a few moments to give you some important information. I realize your time is valuable, so I promise to deliver everything in five minutes or less. Jordan qualifies for special education with a learning disability in oral expression and reading comprehension. This is his educational diagnosis, not his medical diagnosis, but it is the best descriptor of his educational difficulties. So his medical condition is something you probably haven't heard. It's called complete agenesis of the corpus callosum. This is a picture of the brain, and all of those stringy things in between are uh, make up the corpus callosum. It's made of billions of fibers that connects the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere, and he doesn't have that at all. Uh, his brain has made new pathways around it, but it does manifest in different ways in different people. So not everyone without a corpus callosum behaves in the manner that he does, um, but it's important for you to understand how that manifests in him. These are his current cognitive scores. I guess he has a great memory, especially short-term memory, and difficulty with long-term retrieval. So that's going to be struggling with accessing prior learned information. So 
and this part is really interesting to me, um, is auditory processing is actually average. And we'll see why that's interesting in a moment. But it's visual, spatial thinking is a struggle, and you'll see that in folded papers, in geometry, and in letter formations. This is the celebration part of his cognitive assessment, because you can see his basic reading, such as fluency, and uh, decoding are all average. And another celebration is written expression. That just means he can write a complete thought in a sentence, uh, but then you see the reading comprehension is well below average. Um, fluency is great, but comprehending and understanding is definitely below. Here is the listening comprehension that shows extremely below average. It's interesting because auditory processing is fine, but this is making sense of what he's hearing. And so whole class lectures are going to be really challenging for him unless supported with written content. This is great. His calculation and fluency in math are awesome. And then the problem solving is where you see it below average. These are two of three goals for him. I wanted to read every day and also want him to perform well on tests before corrections. And his third goal is the big one. It's organization. Definitely not his strength. Um, we will be working on that at home as well. These are most of his accommodations that you can read over. Um, we did discuss these according to his cognitive strengths and weaknesses, and many of them we chose to put here because we know that he is working very hard cognitively, and so we want to free up his brain to focus more on those higher processes. His use of a calculator is to help free up his brain to focus more on the problem solving, and the access to word processor is going to be helpful um, to help with legibility of his brain. Here's the schedule for the school year. He's in all regular classes with inclusion support. And as for state testing, he takes the regular state test in a small group with questions read aloud and a calculator. Outside of school, Jordan likes to swim. He's on a swim team. He also plays piano and takes piano lessons every week. He's in Kumon, which is for math to help with the fluency. And he is also in the orchestra and plays the cello. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope it was more informative and engaging than just that IEP paper that you were handed. Um, know that I'm here to support you. We are partners in helping him at home, and I do expect you to push him beyond what he thinks he's capable of doing. So know that yes, he has accommodations to support him, but I do want you to push him to achieve as much as he can do and overcome this disability. Thanks so much. Okay. So I'm a videographer, and so the quality of that, if you are, um, if that's your thing, you can tell that was not a professional video. But I, I use that um, to educate the teachers, and I had a very positive response to that. They're, they're very apt to be clicking a link, and they all watched it, and they all um, got a lot of information very quickly and it was tailored to him. Um, that was just using like iMovies, slicing them together with screenshots, and I also use Adobe Spark the next year. I think the Spark's a little bit easier, um, more user friendly, um, and I'll probably use Spark again for making another one for his teachers. But um, that gives you a little bit of an overview. You can see Jordan's kind of strengths and weaknesses, um, what the agenesis has done with, with him and, and those areas of weakness. Uh, so, I always try to tell the teachers that um, you know, teaching students with disabilities reminds me of driving a car when I compare a student with and without disabilities. So in my English classes, when I have my classes with um, students who are neurocognitive or, or create P, it's like uh, driving an automatic car. You deliver the instruction and the car drives. For the most part, it's fairly easy to deliver the content and it gets um, perceive the way it is supposed to be, or the way you hope it to be. But I attribute teaching anybody with a disability or any type of, especially a cognitive impairment, like driving a standard or a stick shift. And with, uh, when that comes with, a teacher has to have the patience to understand that you have to shift the gears for them. Their brains are not as automatic as neurotypicals, 
and they will not shift and make those neural connections like a neurotypical child will. And so when I talk to teachers, I try to explain that it's labor intensive and it's work, and there may be a need for a lot more repetition than you even think they should have, but expect it. And I always try to tell them to expect more repetition and instruction than you may think, so that they're not frustrated. It is, you know, can become frustrating when they have to repeat themselves so much. And it is part of this disability of needing that extra repetition. Uh, so, overview of the session. I, uh, similar to mine a couple years ago, except that I've reformed it into the different ages. And so, we're going to go through um, looking at the how this is manifesting throughout the different stages of elementary, all the way up to middle school. If you have an, uh, an infant to toddler with a disorder, the folks close to raise your hand if you have really, really young. And then uh, kindergarten through second, any? Okay, so a lot of you. Uh, third, uh, third through fifth, sixth will be upper elementary, okay? And then um, middle schoolers, do you have any? Do you have any high school at all? People who are in high school? Okay, great. So I want to talk about this age, infant to toddler age. Um, we're going to talk about 504 and IDEA and some of the educational programs that are available at this age. Uh, you can start by seeing at this young age how these kids are developing in their cognitive skills uh, just by listening to their, um, their speech, how they answer their questions, when you ask them a why question or a how question, how they problem solve, watching them um, put together puzzles will give you an insight into how the language is developing. That early language is a huge key into kind of seeing how their academics are going to start developing. So pay attention to that when you're in these early years. You can start to uh, look into the signs. My son with ACC could not instill to this day because I think it's partly his visual spatial deficit. He still struggles with puzzles. He struggles between figuring out which pieces are the inner pieces and which ones are the border pieces. Still. And that was something that he uh, did at an early age. And uh, so seeing those little signs are going to give you those clues into academically developing. And so I know with Jordan, he's taking geometry next year as a sophomore. I know that we're going to have to figure out a different plan for him because he does not use his visual space rule in the same way that everybody else. Um, and, that, and I can see that early, early on, before I had his diagnosis um, when he was a toddler. I get this question a lot. Should I put my child in private school, charter school, public school? I'm not going to tell you what you should do, but I want to inform you of some things that I want you to consider. I'm informing you of the protections that you have, and I want you to be aware of those. For my child with ACC, when he was younger, he didn't necessarily need those protections, even if we had known about his disability when he was younger. He acclimated well, he socialized well, we could have easily put him in a private school or a charter school. He was in daycares. He did everything. Neurotypical is so he appeared. My other child with autism and epilepsy struggled <coughs> since age two. He's had he's been uh, under an IEP or an IFSP is what we call it when they're really young since he was two years old. And we still rely very heavily on these protections. So I want to inform you of what these protections are. So you can think of this as you've got ADA. Um, these are our federal legal protections. ADA encompasses everything, but the further out you go, the least protections you have. 504 is a little bit more, and then IDA is the most protected that you will have. So, um, I'm not going to read every single thing from this slide, but you can. <coughs> ADA is a, it's a civil rights law, a federal law. Um, it covers you or from discrimination just going out right here in this hotel. So that entities are not allowed to discriminate based on a disability. And that's just a protection, a very minimal protection that we have for any public space. Uh, I highlighted two of them. Uh, and I'm going to make sure I clarify these. So the second one that says employment state and local government, that covers government child care and extended care. And this, the third one 
covers private schools, child care centers, and hotels, theaters, everything um, that's a public facility. I, I bring this up because when you are considering a school and you need those protections for this child's disability, you need to be thinking of what protections are offered. So if you choose to go to a private school, they are only covered by ADA. So that basic coverage is the law says you can't exclude people with disabilities from programs without evidence that the child poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others, and that the center has demonstrated reasonable efforts to accommodate them or modify the environment for them. And so it's a very minimal law. So when my youngest child, who at the age of two, was showing these severe behaviors, and I need to go to work. And the, in the perfect world at that time, if I could have homeschooled him, which I did for a while, but we came to a point where I needed to work, and we showed up to daycare, he went through seven daycares and after-school programs within a year and a half. We were just asked to leave because they couldn't provide the services that he needed. And because they were a private entity, we have very minimal protections for him. Um, we did have to kind of go through this checklist to make sure that he, you know, was he posing a direct threat and, and was that the, what they were using as a reason for asking him to leave and did they provide reasonable accommodations to help him be successful. But it was minimal and we went through seven within a year and a half span. So one of these exceptions is if you are in a church and that church has their own volunteers within the church, they're not subject to this. So they don't have to follow ADA policies. Um, so just being that. Uh, Section 504 gets into education specifically. It's a little bit more protection. So um, the only qualifications you need for 504 is a medical condition and a learning difference. 504 is very easy to get in terms of getting services. You just need a doctor's note that says you have some kind of medical condition and a learning difference. Notice not a learning difficulty, a learning difference. So right now in my um, typical school year, teaching in seventh grade English, I had last year 125 total students. Of those 125, I would say I had 22 of them that were second language learners, and then I had at least 45 kids that had IEPs and 504 accommodations. The bulk of them had 504 accommodations. Some of them just had a 504 for having a food allergy. It's, it's pretty easy to just get a doctor to say that you have some kind of medical condition and learning difference. So if you're interested in having 504 services, then it's, it's very simple for you to get that. Um, this gives a little more protection. It protects from discrimination in the educational and vocational training environment. So it's specific to education. And it also gives access to that free and public education and to accommodations. They can even go to up through college. So any place that receives federal funding is, has to follow uh, 504 protections. Okay. And then there's IDEA, and that's specifically for individuals who fall under the special education category. This is a little bit harder to get into, get into um, because you have to fit one of the 13 qualifying areas and you have to display an educational need. So just having a disorder of a corpus callosum does not get you in automatically. You have to also demonstrate a, an educational need to get, in, to get covered under IDEA. Uh, if you qualify for that, it will supersede a 504 plan. It still falls under the 504 umbrella, but the, the plan within uh, IDEA will supersede any 504 plans. This one gives you access to not only accommodations, but also extra teachers. So the maximum amount of supports, the maximum amount of procedural requirements that the schools have to follow is through IDEA. Um, so again, just looking at the overview, minimal protections for a private school, charter school, uh, 504 is and IDEA are for schools that receive federal funding. So there are charter schools that do receive federal funding, um, but knowing that IDEA gives you the most protections and uh, the most supports in terms of accommodations and staff. So going back to this, and if you are considering 
private versus public school, you just really need to ask yourself whether you need these kinds of protections. And you may be, you may have a child that is fine, that can go to a private school or a religious school and do just fine. Um, there are others of us that might go through phases where they need help uh, advocating for supports. And there may be times in your um, child's education where you didn't need it one year and you might need it another. I would at least recommend to get the 504. At the minimum, get the 504 so that it's documented that there is a medical condition um, that requires, that may or may require in the future some kind of educational supports. Um, there are so minimal um, supports, and so like I said, I have kids on 504 plans who just have food allergies, and all they have is a piece of paper that says they have this condition and nothing else. But at the minimum, I would recommend at least getting that 504. Under the new ICD-10 billing codes, that's great. That's great. Right you now. don't have to go with like local developmental um, delay or one of those general courts. There is a very specific code. That's great. I need to look into that. That's great. So looking at these young young kiddos, you can go ahead and get protected under IDA from birth through what we call in Texas is early childhood intervention, and in different states call it different things. But my youngest, like I said, makes two. He already felt that he was covered under IDEA, the full amount of protections for a child with a disability. Um, those criteria are that he needs a medical diagnosis, or he is my child, your child needs a medical diagnosis, um, or some kind of uh, visual impairment that qualifies or a developmental delay. My, my younger son's uh, case, he had a developmental delay, so he qualified. Um, and then they can already get access to accommodations, and they call it an individualized family support plan when they're little because they typically come into your home and they provide supports there. Sometimes they have group centers, but oftentimes the supports are at their home. When uh, going back to the other, Schaefer, my youngest, qualified for ECI. Uh, but Jordan, my child with uh, agencies, did not. We actually tested him when he was. Um, Two, because he had tubes in his ears and we were concerned about whether his hearing was interfering with his understanding of directions. <laughs> Didn't qualify. So, um, so I've, I've had one go through, one, one not. Preschool programs. So once they enter age uh, three to five, it's different per state, but in, the, in Texas, we, they call them a PPCD, Preschool Program for Children with Disabilities. They have all kinds of acronyms, as you know, in education. Um, but they, they have dual enrollment, they have all kinds, I don't know what your state they call it, but this is a program that helps ease them into school age programs. And so this starts to add more time in their day. So instead of them coming to your home, the child can then go to a uh, facility. Usually these are only half day programs. Um, and then you would, in our case, we had to supplement if we wanted to do it for, for a full day, we had to do part uh, daycare, part uh, PBCD. Once he turned four, we could do PBCD, pre-K with inclusion support, and then we made it almost through the whole day, then he just needed after school care. So by the time he was four, he was pretty much um, getting those IEA covered supports for 80% of his day. Prior to age four, he was getting about I don't know, 40 or 50% of his day was covered. The rest of it was private school. And so for my younger child that has severe social and behavioral deficits, it was a challenge to find a place where he could stay so that I could work my job. Um, but by the age of four, you can pretty much have them in school, and then they can go to after school care programs. Um, after school care programs for us was another nightmare because, again, they're not with the school. They may be on school campuses, but they are not receiving federal funding directly. And so that then falls into going in, uh, under the ADA umbrella, which is minimal coverage. So we, we had our times where we were kicked out of after school programs. Um, it was definitely a challenge. So once you get into elementary school, you start getting into the full blown IEP process. Um, a couple things I want to encourage you. So the IEP process is kind of boring. So what we're going to go through, I want you to leave here informed of how you can prepare yourself for these programs because if you get into special education, you're going to be going through these meetings once a year at least. Um, but 
I would use a template, and uh, you can create one through these slides today, create your own, doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, but I would use that to take your meetings and to prepare for the meetings so that you can know the areas that they will be talking about. Always ask for a draft before a meeting. I always do that. If they can't give you a draft before the meeting, then you need to ask for the day to be You deserve the time to look it over. You should not be blindsided with information in a meeting. This should not happen. And you also have a right to do a pre-art conference. If you think there are some things that, that they may not consider, then ask for it. And again, if they can't do it before the meeting, then they need to move the date. So those are the two things I would ask for. Ask for a draft. And if you think there's something you need to negotiate before the meeting, ask for a pre-art conference. You hash that out. The meeting should typically just be signing the paper, going over it quickly, but you should all be in consensus before you walk in the door. It shouldn't be battling out in the meeting. Uh, and then I did create something um, just this year that I'm going to be handing out to my son's teachers. And um, you're welcome to have a copy if, if uh, you like. But I made a, um, looks like a little flyer. It's a one-page uh, one but two-sided call for educators. Um, it just gives an overview of a colossal disorder. Uh, what is it? What are the common difficulties? And on the back side, here are some tips for evaluators, so the people who are assessing them as well as tips for the classroom. Um, you're welcome if you would like to hand this out to your uh, child teacher, it's fine. Um, but I made this just so that I would have something to hand them to educate those teachers who don't know anything about this condition. Because nine times out of 10, they've never heard of it before. Um, if you'd like a copy of that, you can email me or let me know my name. Uh, put your email on the chat scene. Okay, so these are the eight main parts of an IEP. Some people get really stressed out going to going these meetings, and it's primarily because you don't know all the parts and what, what's supposed to be covered. So my, my draft of this when I go to IEP meetings is just, I number one through eight. Before I go to meetings, I go through this myself, and I think about what I would like for them to discuss, and if they don't cover it, then I bring it up in my meeting. I just number one through eight. Um, they, typically go in this order, different states may call them slightly different things, but they're all very similar because, again, special education is a federal program, and there's a little bit of differentiation between the states. Um, so we're going to go through each of these parts just so you know what each one entails. Um, they always start with, um, they're called here, review assessment and qualifying area, and that's based on a cognitive assessment. Don't be afraid to get a cognitive assessment. Yes, it will highlight areas of weakness, and yes, it, will, it would highlight areas of strengths. You need those. You need to know what those weakness areas are to justify these accommodations. It's very helpful. So don't be afraid to talk openly about them. Um, these are the, they call them the, the G's in terms of cognitive assessments. I know that there's a session that delves into that, um, but we're not going to dive too deeply into it. But it's important to know where the strengths are and where the weaknesses are. And it's also important to know that your medical diagnosis does not always equate to your education. I need to look into this new um, coding that I have not heard about yet, but what we uh, we always try to find the one that's closest to the, the difficulties of our child because at this point we've not had an agenesis of the corpus callosum category. So, yes? Um, in the ICD-10, it's Q04.0. Okay. So, um, like, I know I get reimbursement for something that I can't have a lot of insurance company reimbursement. That's the code. So, so that's the code for um, the school getting reimbursement? Or no, 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 no. This, is, this is like the code, so I mean, it, that's medical billing. It's, it's, it's medical billing, billing but, but it's a code that you mentioned that I It's the diagnosis It's a diagnosis code. code that goes on everything. But I don't know if it's made it into um, IDEA in terms of the educational qualifying area. At this point, I know that there are only 13 educational, there are 14, uh, but I only know of 13 official educational diagnosis. So that's why I said I would I think to look into that. So um, there, um, there's, it's great that they have it medically, but I don't know that we have our own category educational yet. Um, and so it doesn't always align with medical, but it's okay. Um, it, some people get a little hung up on the label here. And I, I, even though there's not a category for a disorder of corpus callosum, it's just a label. It's usually always size. It's not always. So like my son originally had LD, a learning disability. That was his original. Yeah. And, and I kept that because it's the best reflection of his educational 
needs. So that's why I had that. So he, had, he now has OHI. I had um, Emily Travis, where we were, where I still am employed. They didn't want to give us OHI and LD. I don't know why. I should have multiplied that battle, but they said we can't do learning disability and other health and care. Why? They wouldn't give me a good reason. I chose not to fight it. We moved back to our own home district, and Dripping Springs said, yeah, we need to add that. It didn't change any of his services, though. It was just a label. But typically, you'll find it as a learning disability um, or other health and care. I, I didn't want to go with just other health and care originally, though, because when you see OHI and a teacher sees that, it triggers ADHD. Because generally OHI is for kids with ADHD and didn't want these teachers to see OHI and all that they think it was ADD or ADHD. Because my better picture of him was the learning disability and listening and reading comprehension. And I wanted them to see that first. So that's why we still have that primary. OHI is secondary. Yeah. For Rita explained it, the OHI is for longer. Because he had a developmental delay and other things as well, but the OHI qualifies where the other ones only qualified until age 18 without a medical diagnosis. But OHI qualified for What state are you in? Utah. Utah. And that, that may be different states. I know um, for my son who is projected to graduate when he's 18, 19 years old, uh, it didn't matter which label for him, uh, he'll get the same services. But each state may be a little bit different in those. Um, the only label I do know, though, that gives a little bit more services is if you get the autism label. I have not got that label for Jordan. For grandmother, I'm sorry, I have not um, searched into that label for him. It's not hard to get autism, but the only extra thing it gives you is um, access to parent and in-home training, that's it. Otherwise, you get the same access to services. So the label, again, is just a label. It, it, I would encourage you to go and pursue autism if you need those extra training. That's, that's my only recommendation. Otherwise, it's just okay to get access to services. And it's similar medically. If you need therapies, uh, we, with my younger child, getting the office and label opened up therapies that we needed and limited therapies. And so it's, it's uh, a label to get you access to services. That's all it is. So within learning disability, they have subcategories. So uh, Jordan's qualifying areas within learning disability are in listening and reading comprehension. So you can have a learning disability in any area or any combination of areas. Um, and again, as you all know, it's a spectrum disorder very similar to autism. And it affects you know, social, behavioral, academic, it, it affects a lot of areas. And I think that's why a lot of people do pursue the autism label, because autism is kind of like a package deal of services is the best way to put it. So if you're needing this package of services, then I would ask for consideration for autism. And again, and one thing about autism is just a rating scale to qualify. To qualify a student with an autism disability, there's no blood test, there's no MRI, it's just a rating scale. You just have to show social and behavioral tendencies to qualify. And a lot of our kids with, with ADCC have those tendencies that are very similar. Um, the second part of this, some people get a little upset about this this part because it's a little bit too raw, but it's present level, so we call it a plaque. And it, it's supposed to portray where your child is right now. And I've had some beautifully written plaques for my kids, and it paints a picture of exactly where they are, the good and the bad. And I encourage you to not be offended by some of the directness of it. You, if you don't like the wording, you can ask them to be a little more objective, which they should be. But this should portray exactly where they are, because you need to know where they are to know where they need to go. Um, and that's how you build the goals and objectives that they need to, or that you would like for them to accomplish. Um, you want to hang on to the that progress of those goals in case you are uh, seeing regression. So we're going to talk about this a little bit later. If regression is an issue, of regression of skills for your child, then you need to be hanging on to all this progress. Um, service page, that's part three, and when they're younger, they don't really have services because they're in your home, but once they get into preschool age, they have a variety of ways of looking at services. You've got where they're getting their services. Is it in the regular class or the special class? Who is providing the services, the regular teacher or the special teacher, and who is grading their work? And we have had all kinds of combinations. It doesn't have to be all one or all the other. We've had half and half. We've had half gen ed setting, half special ed setting, half regular.
you were going to teach your half specialty. We've had all kinds of nominations, and it's an individualized plan, so you may individualize it how you need. Um, typically, speech and OT services are related services, um, and those are the ones that they usually pull from classes to do. So if you have a child that needs speech services, they'll, they'll try to pull from elective classes, um, or they'll come in and they'll work with the um, child in the classroom. Um, and then accommodations and modifications. I want, to, I want you to be clear on the difference between these. It's like a bridge. I mean, the plaque tells you where your child is, and then the other side of the bridge is where they should be performing at that grade level, and those accommodations just give that support. So if your child struggles with reading fluency, then maybe you give them, you read it to them orally so that they can get the same material as everyone else. The problem comes when you start changing the curriculum for that child. That's when it becomes a modification. While kids are in elementary through middle school, it may not make a big difference, but the minute they hit high school, it changes their graduation plan, and that's what we've dealt with this year. Uh, making that decision of whether we modify, and once you start changing that curriculum, you are altering that graduation plan. Um, and it's okay to we've done a combination of both in the elementary years, but the further you are in modifications, the further you are from the general ed curriculum, and the wider that gap can become. Um, and so you, you want to try to accommodate first, <coughs> And if those accommodations aren't sufficient, then you want to consider modifications. So that's the general rule of thumb. And so I put uncommon accommodations here. These are some that uh, we have used for our kids and I, that I've seen in my teaching profession. Uh, I want to show these uncommon ones because you will get into schools where they have a checklist. Be aware of checklists. Don't let them just check off accommodations. You've got to remind them this is an individual education plan. Uh, so one of the big things that I found helpful, especially in the middle school years, is asking them to let your child retest for full credit. Some schools will cap it. I know our school is notorious where if they retest it, they can only get up to a 70. Well, if you've got a 68 average, 70 didn't help you much. So uh, we've asked for retesting for full credit. We've asked for a second check on tests and quizzes, where they look it over before they turn it in. There are all kinds of creative things we've asked for. Oral administration is a pretty common one where someone will read it. Um, reducing the assignment. Be careful with saying reduced assignments. Don't leave it open-ended because teachers can interpret it differently. What do you mean reduced? Be specific. Reduce the amount of time. Let's say you only want to work 30 minutes per night. You can say that. Maximum of 30 minutes per night of homework. Um, or reduce the amount of pages or amount of work. Um, so I would encourage you to be specific. Copies of notes is pretty standard. Um, and the same with, uh, I'm sure you want to time, accommodated versus modified work. Be careful with the modifications. Um, no penalty for spelling. If you have someone that, that you don't want them to be penalized for spelling. Use of a planner or a calendar. That's one thing I'm noticing is my son's organization is, is horrible. He, we have to be his executive function with anything he organizes. Um, and we have to let the teachers know that he can type things uh, because he can't read his writing. And they're thankful. Now, in this day and age, accessing technology, there's not much of a pushback like it used to be. Um, and so technology requests are, are very welcome uh, that I've seen at this point in my teaching. Um, and then reduced homework. That, again, that's that extra time. You have to decide as a parent what you want their homework load to be. And so if you want to put in the time to go give them that extra help, then um, that's your parent choice about how much is too much at home. And, and there are some parents that just they can't do any homework, and you need to be honest with yourself and with your um, team of teachers about what you can handle at home. So if, if you really can't do a lot of homework because the day is just too draining, then let them know that honestly it's okay. I mean, a lot of them don't have a child with a disability. They don't understand what it's like when they leave the school doors. So don't be afraid to be honest about, you know, by the time he, my child gets home, there's nothing left and there's no time for homework. It's okay. That may be all that that child can cognitively handle. Um, part four, they always have to, this is a, a big legal requirement, they have to make sure that they consider the least restrictive environment. I'm not going to read this whole blur, but I took this from Rice Law. It just says you've got to consider the least restrictive area that a child can meet the goals within their uh, plan, either a 504 plan or a uh, an IEP plan. And so ideally you want them in the general ed uh, setting as much as possible. 
before you start pulling them into that more special edu education restrictive setting. And so you have to go over this. If you're in an IEP meeting and they don't talk about this least restrictive environment, then you might want to go back and address that because they're required to consider what's the least invasive way to deliver this IEP. Um, ESY is not summer school. Um, ESY is extended school year. So if you have a child that progresses in skills over the summer, then that's where you go back and you find those goals and figure out if they have not been making progress toward those goals. You need to talk about keeping them in some kind of learning environment over the summer. And if a school notices that regression and listens to you and your input as a parent, then they should be providing those extended school year services to you. Um, graduation plans actually start at age 14 if you have an IEP. And so they start asking kids at age 14, um, interviewing them to try to figure out what pathway they're, they're considering. So even though they're not graduating by the age of 14, they start looking into that with an IDEA um, on an IEP. You'll see that part added to an IEP at that age. Um, and again, that they, I do have some extra legal basis. There are some case studies about ESY where um, some parents have wanted extended school year services and the school did not provide it. The school is not allowed to look at just one criteria. They have to look at multiple angles. And so if the school says, well, they're not, they're, they're not showing any regression, and they're only looking at regression data, then I would encourage you to look at the, um, some of the legal bases that are out there that show that they should not be focusing only on one area. And then the last part, supplements. That's the part of the IEP. If you have a personal care plan or an autism supplement or a visual or auditory supplement, that's just an extra place where those, if you have an epilepsy plan, um, that would go in point six. Um, emergency plans, behavior plans also fit in, into the supplements as well. And then the very end, deliberations and consensus. The deliberations part of an IEP is kind of like the summary, but it's also where you can ask them to add your comments, your um, summaries, or maybe you want to put something specific uh, about this condition. The deliberations is kind of a catch-all at the end. Um, and when you get to the consensus part, if you don't agree, then don't agree. Check, disagree. It's not always a fun process, but um, you know, two ways to look at it. If, if you really feel strongly about something, if you click that disagree, it throws the schools into this five-day um, process where they have to negotiate with you and you have to meet within five days. Um, you can even go through mediation, due process hearing, or all kinds of things you can go through. But the other flip side of looking at it is, let's say you agree and then ten days later you want to change it. You can always have another meeting. So there are different ways to approach it. You can sign if you feel comfortable and just tell yourself you want to try it for 10 days and then you want to go back and change it. Or if you really are frustrated, you can disagree and there are legal steps to help you through that. It's not common, but um, it is a possibility. Most of you have been, how many people have been through the IEP process this year? Okay, so not you. What I figured out is that the school system really doesn't react well when parents come in with a very aggressive stance, because this is a team effort. We brought, we always bring donuts because we always have early morning IPs, and one year they said, oh, we're so glad you brought donuts, not an advocate, because apparently the day before they had the next meeting. But um, hopefully, you know, if you don't come in with an aggressive stance, you'll be able to work through these things. But I think you should also be creative about what you ask for. Every time our son switches the school building and switches an IP team, we have written in before, the week before school starts, we will meet with the entire team for our son so that we can pass along information. It's not easy for them to do that. They have all sorts of administrative meetings. They make it happen. Before he hits a new building, all the fire alarms are covered from the third grade to pull the fire alarm 20 minutes into the first day of school, and they don't want that to happen. But think creatively, and if you are not really aggressive, the school system will most likely work for you. Um, we also took a picture, because we're talking about a child that's not in the room, and I think that that's very helpful, especially when you're switching schools, but donuts go a really long way. Yeah, that's that was facilitating IT meetings. He just like donuts. He just like any food. Any free food. Yes, Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks, yes. Yeah. Oh, Starbucks. And that's, and you'll see that when, when you get into the upper elementary and things become more complex, you really do want to work together and not against. It is, 
we've had both experiences uh, where we've had a great, you know, great experience with Jordan, and we've also had our second child. We've had about our way through some pretty awful experiences. We've, we've done both. It's not fun, um, but as much as you can work together, it's, it's going to be helpful. That third grade year, though, is, is that's what I call the pivotal year. You begin to see gaps. You begin to move from concrete to abstract. Standardized testing in Texas begins at third grade. And those uh, cognitive assessments become more comprehensive. And so my youngest child, he had a cognitive assessment in when he was in first grade. And he had it again three years later. And the differences in the depth of the assessment knowledge we received when he was a little older was, I mean, it was strikingly different. Um, and so third grade is that year where you really get to see those gaps and see the transition from concrete to abstract. Um, I always, we always do a private assessment in addition to a school assessment. The schools typically assess uh, what has been learned, and so it's great based on So they'll take whatever grade your child is in, and they will assess how they're learning the knowledge. It's different when you take them to a private psychologist, and they use age-based knowledge. And they're not just looking at learned knowledge, they're looking at stored knowledge. So I panicked when I had the school assessment and then I got the private assessment and I said, how are these scores different? These are supposed to be standardized tests. I don't understand why I'm seeing some of these differences. Um, and that's the angle that they're testing. You're going to see lower scores when they look at the stored knowledge for age-based norms than you will sometimes for the, the school test. However, you can request certain assessments to be done by schools if they have those materials. So if you want certain uh, cognitive tests to be performed, you can request those. Uh, but we typically always uh, have the school do theirs, and then we do our own privately. Um, the biggest thing I've noticed with my son at ACC is the language, not just the academic, but the social impact of language for him, the understanding, the uh, dialogue that happens when he uh, is talking to people, the depth of understanding and the depth of his comprehension and responses. Um, the reading and the language element infiltrates every other subject area. And so seeing that he struggles with reading comprehension, it just goes into everything else that he is, he's doing. Um, when you're in an early elementary school, there's a, there's a pattern of learning that has been proven scientifically. This is the best way to learn to read. There used to be a movement for whole language years ago, and we have, the research is clearly showing that there is a progression that people learn when they're learning a language. Um, starting with those pre-reading skills that you see very early with when the children are writing and uh, going into decoding when they're actually recognizing that that kuf sound is represented with a, uh, a letter. And then moving into fluency where they're starting to put it together and they're reading uh, with expression and fluency. Those stages from <coughs> early development to fluency then have to, oops, um, but they have to translate over into comprehension. And that reading shift happens right around that third grade age. You are no longer learning to read in third grade. At that point, you're reading to learn. So if you have a child that's struggling with reading, they've already shifted into reading to learn. And so you're going to have to continue to fill those reading gaps when the school is moving on expecting kids to already have their reading intact. Um, another issue I noticed, with, uh, especially with Jordan as he's getting older, is his higher level thinking processes. Um, he can read beautifully. I mean, his fluency scores are fine. But making sense of what he's reading is a, is a different question. Um, sarcasm and idioms, when you have, uh, even just in, in conversation, he doesn't always catch those, and I know Kathy and I have talked about that before, um, and really kind of picking up on themes and morals. Um, those, are, those are struggles, and those are more abstract thoughts. So I want to show you, this is based on Texas, but I find this very interesting. I want to show you um, some of the language that you can pick up on when you're looking at the difference between second and third grade. You can't really see it unless you're up close. But I highlighted some of um, some of these verbs that change. So in, in, typically in, in curriculums, they spiral skills. So you're still doing multiplication, but you're doing a complex 
best version of it in third grade. All these fields spiral all the way through school. Um, but notice the difference in the verbs here. In second grade, I just want you to recognize. Third grade, I want you to apply. Name to explain. Think about the difference, the cognitive skill from just naming something to explaining. Partition, so it's a math skill, right? They're asking you to section all things with an ability to represent, use to solve, explain to compose. So these verbs increase as these kids progress. And what you notice is the higher up the verb task goes, the more multi-step and more multi-cognitive processes are required. Um, in the education world, we refer to these as Bloom's taxonomy. Um, Bloom's, uh, the research has shown us that there are different taxonomies of thought. And so uh, cognitive is more attitude and self-thought. Um, affective is emotional thinking. And then psychomotor is just the actual acts of mental skills. Um, with Jordan, he can do about the first three so knowledge, comprehension, and application. We get down to analysis and synthesis and evaluation, and the, the understanding starts to break down with them. Where we see this is in answering complex questions. So you think about a classroom and the type of higher level questions that teachers are required to ask is these students who are lacking those abilities to think in the higher order of thinking are struggling because they're still functioning on those naming and recall. Um, so when, when Jordan was younger, let's switch over here, before his diagnosis even, we used to do these fun, uh, we, we just give him a poem and say, hey Jordan, we're gonna memorize this poem. And so we would have him. Sean and Elsa, four of all the ancient spirits. On the first heel of the nest, God just shall stand upon myself by reading legacy. Nature's the quest gives nothing but death land, and being great, she wants to go to free. Then beauty is minor, why dost thou abuse? The bounty is largest, give and need to give. Profitless user earth, why dost thou use so great a sum of sum, yet canst not live? For having traffic with thyself alone, thou of thyself thy sweet self dost deceive. Then how will nature calls thee to be gone? All the acceptable art can sell leaves. Thy unused beauty must be tuned with thee, which you should which you should as we tend to your tree. So to that church. Um, that was a Shakespeare poem and you know we had a lot of fun seeing if you could memorize things. And so when we first got this diagnosis, we were trying to make sense of well, but you can memorize these really challenging words in these poems. And I remember the Bloom's taxonomy. That's still a lower order recall. It's great and it's fascinating to understand what he's you know, cognitively working against, but memorization is just recall. That is not what our kids are being asked, and that is not the level of thinking that schools are demanding, and that they need to be for graduation and entering the workforce. Um, and so I want to talk about standardized testing which I know it rubs people the wrong way. Um, and the abstract testing, or the abstract questions that come with that. So I took this just to show you how these Bloom's questions work. And this comes from the Star All test in Texas. So Texas, we have two tests. You got one for individuals who have a severe cognitive impairment, and you've got the regular test. Nothing in between. They used to have something in between, but no longer. You've got one or the other, one doesn't qualify. For the lower test, we have to take a regular test. But it's interesting to look at the different levels of questions. This is a level one question for a star all student. The question is, find the bridge over the Brazos River. Okay? Recall, or, or not even recall, this is just can you find it? You've got words, a two sentence, they're actually just one sentence and a picture. So all your brain has to do is comprehend what they're asking. Find the bridge and know the point. Everybody with me on that one? Level one task. Level two. So now we have find how people crossed the river before the bridge was built. I have two sentences, two pictures. Now my brain has to still comprehend the question, but now I have to discriminate between two things. A little bit higher. 
higher task, but again, it's broken down so we can see it's a, it's a higher progression from just pointing to one picture. By the time you get to level three, look at the amount of words and sentences. You've got paragraphs. And now there are no more pictures, or there's a little picture, but not in your answer choices. Your answers are now in word format, you have three. You have to discriminate now to three sentences. Level four, now the question is asking, why? Justify. Abstract me on the page reasoning. So you've got lots of sentences, paragraphs, three answer choices in word form. They have to sequence events, put them in order, and explain why they put them in order. So again, think of the cognitive tasks that you have to do to create the answer for this question. They come naturally for neurotypical people, but for a child with a cognitive impairment, the amount of things your brain has to do to figure that out is becoming a multi-step question. Now I've got the regular test in text. This is a sixth grade reading test. Um, the author's use of the first person point of view in this story enables the reader to. So if I'm thinking about the cognitive and affective and psychomotor areas of limbs, they have to think about their thinking. They have to think why did the author use the first person? So they have a perspective take. Why did the author do that? Then they have to think about themselves. How did that affect me as a reader? Multi-step, perspective, okay? Um, and then making conclusions. Having to infer meaning beyond the page, that's a whole other level of comprehension. And then in math, this is a regular sixth grade math test, Look, having to analyze a picture, which statement is best supported by the information in the pictograph, the amount of things your brain has to do to be able to compare visual images and comprehend the senses. So I show you these because of the... Sure. I think teaching executive functioning skills, mental executive functioning skills, is it, you have to break everything down into, the, into explicit steps. And so I was uh, talking to Dr. Lynn Paul, who has a lot of experience with researching kids with TCCs and with questions. And we talked through that. We talked about how can we set up a, an executive functioning list that, for thinking. Because it's it's no different from you know having to have a list in the shower that says you know to put the soap in your hand you know that kind of thing but this would be a more of a metacognitive list it's harder because you can't see it it's not like putting the soap in your hand in the shower and that kind of a list um, but I think teaching metacognitive skills is it's the only way to put something abstract into concrete and so I, I think it's it's the most challenging thing that we can do. Um, but you, you're going to have to break everything down. So these types of questions that are multi-step, you've got to teach them to think about their thinking and how to break it down. And the more complex the question, the more they have to break it down and they have to learn how to do that. So you have to kind of start from the, the easiest and progress. Yeah.
and that's where he doesn't know where it's breaking down, but I need to give him a tool to help him know how to figure out where it's breaking down. So I think um, if we're going to play around with that, and maybe if we get back to you, you can lend me your contact information, I can share how that's going. Um, it's an experiment right now. So I mean, when it comes to cognitive and education, it's all trial and error. We don't have research specifically for helping kids with these media or, or even learning disabilities. So, two-handed. 
And so what I had to do was he would learn one hand, and then he would learn the other hand, and then I would play the right and he played the left. And then we would switch. Uh, he would play the right, I would play the left. And we had to integrate that together. I saw the same thing with his academics. When he was learning an abstract or higher order skill, I would have to do one part and he would do the other, then we'd trade places. And then I would eventually just start backing away and letting him do those processes on his own. But I had to break everything down to the most concrete explanation and build from there. And I felt like it was frustrating because I felt like every time he would get a new skill, especially um, in math, because we, we were Kumon, we had all these foundational skills, and they would ask him something that he knew how to do computationally, but then when I would explain it to him, we'd have to go back to the computation. And I had to remind him, this is this. You know this part. He just couldn't connect that that was what the question was asking. So I had to, again, with that you know, analogy of driving a stick shift, I had to make that connection for him and remind him, this is the algebra you've been doing. You just didn't recognize that here in the question. We had to make those connections to tell him that that's what he was doing. And then leveraging his strengths. Algebra was easy for him. He does, and memorization was easy. You know, having him do patterns, linear thinking, because the visual spatial was a struggle for him. We had to make everything that was visual, we had to make it linear. Um, the first neurologist we saw in San Antonio, when we originally got the diagnosis and we found out about this visual spatial deficit in addition to the corpus callosum, I looked at the doctor, and he's this gray haired doctor who's uh, he went to Harvard Medical and just lots of experience. And I said, well, what, what do I do about geometry? And he said, don't have him take it. And it rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, you're not, you have to find a way around that. And so we are starting geometry next year. And I already know that I can't have Jordan look at a triangle or a quadrilateral. I can't expect him with an impaired visual spatial to know how to see the triangle. He can see the triangle, but in a way that you need to for geometry, I can't teach him that way. His strength is memorizing patterns. So I'm going to have to teach him to see geometry through patterns and memorization. So instead of teaching him to look, oh, this is a triangle, this is what it looks like, I have to tell him, no, the triangle has three sides, three points. I have to teach him a rule-based method to see the triangle. Does that make sense? And so I had to do the same thing with puzzles. He still can't see that the puzzle piece is an is a, uh, edge piece. He has to follow the rules because he can do that. That's a strength. He can tell that it's an edge piece because of the rules I've taught him. And that's going around the, the stumbling blocks or the obstacles that his brain has. I've got to teach him geometry this year using a rule-based method, which is not typical because your default for a teacher, for a kid that struggles, is to add a visual. Well, my kid has a visual spatial deficit, so those defaults for teachers aren't going to work for him because he's visually spatially impaired. Um, so leveraging those strengths are going to be important. And then when they get to middle school, start looking for that executive functioning assistance because once they start changing classes, seven and eight classes, it becomes an organizational mess. And it also becomes an organizational mess in their brain of filing new information. When they learn something new, I, it's like my son's room. When, he, when I go into his room and I give him clothes to put away, they don't get filed in the right drawers. Well, that's his brain. When he learns a new task, he doesn't file it in the right place. So when he goes to look for it, he can't find it. So using anything on paper for those thinking skills will help them connect it to what they know and file it properly so they can find it. Oftentimes, he's not functioning well. I, I tell the teachers, you know, it's like a light bulb. Some days the light's on a little bit. Some days the light's off. Some days it's flickering. He can't find the information. It's there, and we have worked on it. It's just misfiled. And it makes sense why it's misfiled. We can't, these neurons can't just go grab it like we can. It's searching for a signal. And some days he can find it really fast, and other days he can't. And so using any kind of concrete organizational assistance and telling teachers to explicitly break everything down to the concrete, including social interactions. I'd love to explore um, more about social. That is a theme I'm hearing, just the concerns about social development, and that's not what this session is about. But it, social plays a huge part of schooling, 
and teaching Jordan social skills has been the exact same way. We have to break it down to the concrete, we have to practice repetition, repetition, and we have to tell him that this example was just like a new example. We have to make that connection for him because he doesn't transfer information in terms of this is just like what I just learned. You have to manually shift and make that neuron recognize that the, those practices are, are the same. Um, so anything else that we want to talk about in terms of social? We have um, about seven or eight minutes left that you wanted to bring up. We've got some time for that. I just have a question around, sure. um, in my case, I, uh, I have a child that is going to be in or terms of soon and has been in the way of intervention uh, for speech. And uh, we were actually in a private school, so that was early elementary school, and I want to make sure that I either stay connected in some fashion with the public school and the support system. I know we're not allowed to have some of that support, but I want to make sure that whatever there is out there for us, that we stay connected. Yeah. And any advice? I would ask. I don't want to tell the private school for that matter. I would find out to see, do they receive any federal funding? I would ask that question first. Um, if the answer is yes, then your child can get a 504 foundations, just like they would in a public school. So I would, I would find out for sure, does that private school receive federal funding? And so if they don't, um, then it was minimal, uh, minimal coverage under ADA, you still have some um, supports there. But the, uh, it's, it's going to be different when you enroll in public school than with any kind of school that receives federal funding versus uh, a school that doesn't. Because a private school that doesn't receive federal funding is, does not have to answer to the same um, requirements. I think so, it's more about the, what I can do, other than like single phone call as far as I mentioned so far to get advice from me uh, as a parent, I, to, I know eventually it's crack the public school system because it's what I'm going to grade for. So, uh, and it lasts a lot of it, but um, maintain, and I know that they'll do the IED evaluation, so if you're here normally, I just want to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're just looking at it. Right. Yeah, and then your child will transfer in at, at the end to a book, whenever you decide or going to make grade. Uh, they will accept that, but they will adapt it to the public school. Um, but yes, they will adapt that plan into public school. But I would imagine, um, that they're, they're going to be following closely in terms of curriculum and other things. So, yeah. Yes. On another on one of the slides, you had the word prosody. I guess I think yes. about, can you explain that? Speech. And just, um, so within speech, you have fluency and grade, and prosody is how, like my intonation, which is how I spoke just now, um, prosody includes how you are, your message is coming across. Um, and so you might find some kids who have a very monotone speech that is like this without that level of intonation. Um, and so prosody includes speed and inflection of voice. So is that, was that in reference to how the ACC child speaks to you or how you speak to them? I think it was on the slide just in language development in general and how, um, if I had to do it, I could find that slide. But um, it was one of the factors of language development and how um, prosody is one of the ways that your language develops. So, um, and when you're reading for that prosody and fluency, it's, it's an indicator of that their child is struggling in that area. That would be a speech service that they could receive if they, they don't have the correct prosody for their age or for um, what they're reading or what they're speaking. Oh, because another session I was in, the professor used the word and he, he said they can't tell. He, they can't yeah, tell. it was more like how yeah. they perceive you. They can't tell the sarcasm or your inflection, they can't read. Yeah. So that in the language development part, in this context, the prosody is how they're speaking, rate, intonation, pitch, all those things. Um, and so there may be other, yeah, other So as a parent of a child like this, do you, does your child struggle with understanding you if you use different tones of voice? That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Yeah. Some practical understanding of what your lips are so that these right. are parents. No. Right. My son with ACC does not. I'm not showing that. He struggles more with vocabulary. And so, if my tone of voice, um, sometimes he might 
not catch the sarcasm, um, but he, he catches my philosophy. He catches um, my tone. He catches those things. Um, but he may not understand some of the vocabulary or may not get the general sense of what I'm asking him. That's more of what I've seen for him. But I do have students who are affected by how my tone and my speech and my rate. I do have students with different special needs who struggle with that. And so it's not just an ACC thing that struggles with it necessarily. It could be any child with any kind of uh, disability. Um, but my son is not necessarily shown as difficulty in that one area. Um, but I have, do have kids that have in my classroom. Yes. I have a question. You mentioned extended school year. Yes. So does that correlate with how much time they have in special ed or IEP? Um, no, the extended school year is a shortened day, and so it's a separate plan. It's in the IEP, but it's, it's they write what goals they expect them to do in the extended school year setting. So it won't be, you know, whatever minutes are in the regular school year IEP, it won't be exactly like that. They have to write a separate plan for, for that extended school year time. So